refresh your memory and refresh my memory. Okay. Um, okay, we added a constructor to this, I think was the last thing that we did to this. And the constructor, what's the constructor look like? Again, it's going to be public. It's going to match the name of the class. It looks like a method, looks like a function, except there's no return value stated. Strictly speaking, a, a, a constructor returns a pointer to the new object that was created. But we, we're, we're not worried about that. For, for our purposes, it doesn't really return anything. All right? We don't have to define that it returns anything. Let's put it that way. Then we have a list of arguments. In this case, we have a string for the size, a string for the type of crust, and a Boolean if it has pepperoni or not. Now, we can do a couple things with this. We can uh, create another constructor if we want that, let's say, defaulted to pepperoni. So we could have a two-argument constructor that only accepted a size and a crust, and we could default pepperoni to whatever the default was. I mentioned the restaurant that I ate at at Cleveland State where they just cranked out small pepperoni pizzas all day. We could define a no argument constructor that would, def that would create a thin crust, small, with pepperoni if we wanted to. Again, the whole idea is we're giving flexibility to this. So you would need to know your problem and need to know at the pizza place you're writing it for, is there such a thing as a default pizza that they make? What you want to do by creating these multiple constructors is you want the ability to make your class as flexible as possible so that it can be used and, and used in a variety of contexts and it's easy for people to use. Just because we have a constructor doesn't mean we get rid of the sets because there's all kinds of reasons that you might set a field after you've created it. All right. I have a method that calculates bake time here, all right, which says that if it's thin crust, it takes 10 minutes to bake. If it's thick crust, if it's other than thin crust, it takes 16 minutes to, um, to bake. Notice this doesn't accept any arguments. All right. In general, a function is going to get what it needs from two places. One of the places is from the instance variables that have been defined. So in this case, the only thing you need to calculate the bake time is a crust. And the crust is already defined as an attribute. So we don't need to pass any other arguments into here. All right? So if something can be calculated based on the attributes, and only the attributes, then there's, there's probably not the need for any arguments. If there's additional information needed in addition to that, uh, then there may be additional arguments that are, that are uh, um, given for it. All right? So like if we had a method to calculate the price of a pizza, and there was like a preferred customer card, and maybe a pizza for a preferred customer is cheaper than a pizza for a regular person. Well, then we might accept as an argument whether it was a preferred customer ordering that pizza or not. Okay? All right. We tested this through our unit test. And remember, the whole idea of the unit test is we want to test to make sure that our class is created correctly and it can do the things it needs to do. So we're going to set up a series of tests to test thoroughly the class that we've created. So in this case, I know that the, cru that the crust is what determines the bake time. So I'm testing one of each. I'm testing a thick crust and I'm testing a thin crust. And I'm doing that with the constructors. Again, before I had the constructor that accepted an argument, I used a no argument constructor and did sets. But since now I have a constructor that accepts multiple arguments and sets those attributes, I no longer need to do the set. I can no longer call the no argument constructor because I made a constructor. I made at least one constructor. If you've made a constructor, you no longer get the free one that um, is created by the compiler. 
So let's go and run this. Make sure we're all on the same page with this. And then we'll go on. So And here we are. So let me clear the screen. I'm going to compile this. And I can just do star Java, and that will compile all of them. I could also compile unit test. And if I compiled unit test, it would compile the pizza class as well, because it knows that the unit test needs a pizza class, so it would compile that as well. Finally, I can run the unit test. And again, remember the unit test is simply taking the place of a GUI. Right? Eventually, this would probably, if this was made into an actual application, it would be connected to a GUI where people put in their orders and it created these pizza objects and so on and so forth. OK. So it tells us the crust is thin, bake time is 10 minutes. Crust is thick, bake time is 16 minutes. So looks like it's working correctly. Let's write a little function to calculate the price of the pizza. And let's say the price of the pizza is calculated this way. And I'm just making these numbers up. This could be as simple as we have here, or it could be more complicated. Just depends on the pizza place. So, let's say this is our chart to determine the price of the pizza. All right. Plain, that is without pepperoni. For small is $6. For medium is $8. For large is $10. With pepperoni, the small goes up to $8. The medium goes up to $10. And the large goes up to $12. So essentially, small, medium, large, add $2 if it's with pepperoni. Okay, so there's a base price for small, medium, large. There is a $2 additional charge for pepperoni. Now, we could have incorporated in like a thick crust versus a thin crust if we wanted to. All right, but we'll keep it, we'll keep it to this level. This will be fairly straightforward. So let's go in and go and add this method. So I'm going to go here and I'm going to create a method to calculate cost of the pizza. All right? Someone tell me what to type. The first word is low-hanging fruit. So if you don't know anything else, go for it. Public. public Not public static void. All right. We haven't talked about what static is yet, but this, but but where we've done regular functions that depend on the particular pizza that you're talking about. Static functions don't depend on what pizza you're talking about. There's always a formula for it. For example, a formula for a circle is all is the same formula for a circle, or the value of pi is always the value of pi. It doesn't matter what circle you have. So it's not static. And it's not void, because we want this to return a value. It would either be, it would be 
would be double, but for cost, do you have something comparable to decimal that you do, or Java just handles it all as double? We're just going to keep it simple and make it a double. So it returns a double. What's the name of the method? Well, calculate cost. Does this need to accept any arguments? Yes. What? We need to know the crust. Need to know the kind of, well, we don't need to know the kind of crust. We need to know if it has pepperoni or not. You need to know if it has pepperoni or not, and what else do we need to know? The size. The size. The cost. Well, we're going to calculate the cost. Okay. Think of the arguments as being the ingredients. The cost is a return value. All right. The ingredients or the, the factors in affecting the cost are only the size of the pizza and whether or not it has pepperoni. Now, these are already attributes of the pizza. So we already know the size of the pizza and we already know whether or not it has pepperoni. So we actually do not have to pass any arguments in. All right. Because we in fact cannot create a pizza without defining the size, the crust, and whether it has pepperoni or not. We've given it two constructors, and those two constructors either set or default the value of those properties. So I can just do my calculation. So I'm going to do something like this. Double cost. If. Size dot equals small you could do this a lot of different ways all right what I'm going to do is I've noticed that the cost of a pizza there's a certain base cost for small medium and large and then you add two dollars for as pepperoni so I'm going to say if cost equals S, then cost equals, what I say, $6. Yeah, probably should. Size equals medium. Cost equals 8. If cost equals 10, uh, or uh, L rather, then cost equals 10. Right, so that establishes the base cost. Finally, if has pepperoni, then cost equals what? Cost plus, two. cost plus two. Finally, when I'm all done, I'm going to return cost. Now you could have written the if statements a bunch of different ways. You could have used else statements, but that teensy bit of efficiency you get by adding else statements I don't think is worth muddying up the code for. So I'm just going to have a series of three if statements. Those are mutually exclusive categories. It's going to pick which one it is. And then I'm going to add two to the, pepperoni, to the cost if it has pepperoni. I could also use this with a, a case statement, which is, is in many ways a cleaner way to code it. But I don't want to muddy the water right now. So I'll just do it this way. All right. The return sort of reports the answer to whoever called it. OK? It's kind of like the old joke I've seen in movies, like, you know, you, you know, someone goes up to someone and says, do you know what time it is? And they say, yes, and walk away. All right? It doesn't do any good if the function comes up with an answer. If it doesn't tell whoever asked the question, this is the answer. So what we're going to do here is we're going to call this function, and we're going to use that answer somewhere. Maybe we're going to print it on a receipt. 
maybe we're going to display it on the screen so that we can tell the customer, hey, that pizza cost $12 or whatever. But if we ask the pizza, and again, think of it in terms of we're asking the pizza, what's your cost? Calculate the cost. It's okay. If it does it and doesn't tell anyone what the answer it is, then that cost can't be displayed or printed or anything like that. So a function is going to return a value. Think of that as being the answer, the final answer. I've done all my work. I've done everything I needed to. And here is my answer. So now we're going to go into this one. And I'm going to, for these two pizzas, size is, I'm going to ask for the size. Has pepperoni and I'm going to add the cost All right, I think that's correct. I'm going to go copy it for the second pizza. So I'm going to output the size. I'll put whether it has pepperoni. And I'm going to output the cost. So. Let's change this one to true. Let's go and compile this. All right, variable may not have been initialized. Okay, so how will I fix that? initialize it to variable. So when I declare it, set the cost to zero. What the compiler is saying is it could possibly make it through these if statements and not be set to a value. So okay, so we'll make sure it gets set to a value right off the start. Okay, now we're going to run it. First one, crust ties is thin. Baked well, yeah, that's what we said for a thin pizza. The size is large, and it has pepperoni. Or it does not have pepperoni. It's false. What should the amount be? Amount should be $10. And the cost is $10. Could have been neater formatting this, okay? But um, as you see, it's showing the correct results. Crust is thick bake time is 16 minutes, which is correct, size is large, has pepperoni is true, and the cost is $12. So these two pizzas it did correctly. All right. What would we need to test to make sure it did all pizzas correctly? Exactly. We'd need to test each one. So. We would need at least six test cases to test the um, costing. Would try a small, medium, and large without pepperoni, small, medium, and large with pepperoni. Now, I realize that we're not doing any validation, but we're not worrying about validation right now. I know that's a strange thing to say, but we're not going to deal with that right this minute. All right. Later on, when we cover exception processing, we'll say what happens if we gave it a size that wasn't valid. What would we do? 
well, we'll deal with it then. Right now, we're going to make sure we behave and only give good data. We're not worrying about validation now. Now, I would need to test two cases to make sure that the bake time was correct. And I could combine those, so I could test this application pretty thoroughly by with six pizzas. I could do three thin, three thick, a small, medium, large with, a small, medium, large without. And I could test the bake time and I could test the uh, price of the pizza or the cost of the pizza. All right, questions about this? Shouldn't be anything earth shattering, we just added a function to it. Now I want to talk about expanding this a little bit because we have a pizza object that works, but people typically don't call and make an order of just one pizza, right? At least I don't. When you order pizza, there's a good chance you're going to order multiple pizzas. Now again, you might order other stuff as well, but to keep things simple, we're going to just talk about ordering pizza. So a given order can have multiple pizzas associated with it, right? Just like a given student can have many classes associated with it, with them, right? You're enrolled into maybe two or three classes, all right? Uh, an order, in the same way, can have several pizzas on it. Now, we don't know how many pizzas an order is going to consist of, right? Maybe there's an average size. Maybe the average is two pizzas. But there might be someone that only orders one pizza. And there might be someone that is catering for a party or an event or something that might order 12 pizzas. So you don't really know how many pizzas people are going to order. So we're going to make an order class. And the order class needs to have a couple things associated with it. We probably would need the name of the person placing the order. We'd probably need uh, the um, phone number, the address, city, state, and zip. All right. Whether it's pickup or delivery, let's say, we would need. So we need those things. But we're also going to need a list of all the pizzas that are on the order because we want to give a one price for the entire order. I want to say you place the order and your price is, you know, $37 or whatever. Okay? Now, we're going to make a rule that there is a $2 delivery charge if it's delivered. Okay? $2 delivery charge if it's delivered. So the cost of an order is the sum of all the pizzas on that order plus. $2 if it's delivered. If it's not delivered, then it's just the, the cost of the pizzas. All right? So let's make an order class. Public class order. What are some characteristics of an order? There's the name of the order. So it's going to be a string. It's going to be an address for the order, which is going to be a string. Now I'm going to be lazy, and I'm just going to have one field for address. Uh, an address probably would have the street address maybe a second address line, then city, state, and zip. So you probably would have like five fields, but I'm going to be lazy. I'm just going to make one long address line. All right? And there's probably a phone number. And there's a Boolean that states whether it is a delivery or not. Okay? We'll leave it like that so far. So those are some attributes that my class is going to have. It'll have gets and sets for all these, right? So I'll go and I'll create the gets and sets in a minute here for these. And also we'll probably have a constructor. Now when you're thinking of a constructor, you could think of like what would you at the minimum need to know if in order to create an object. What could you not, what would it not make sense to have, to not have, 
on an order. Well, it makes sense that you'd have to have uh, the name, right? It doesn't make sense to have an order. We have an order for, who's it for? I don't know, all right? Address? We could have an, we could have an order without an address, all right? And phone number? We probably want the phone number no matter what. So whether it's delivery or pickup, we probably want the phone number. Um, so, that would tell us how, what constructors we have to make. We also need a list of pizzas. All right, a list of pizzas. Now we studied arrays and we did those like the first week of class. All right, but there are restrictions with some arrays in Java. So I need aware of like the big restriction with the array object in Java. Big restriction. You have to know the number of items going into the array. When you define an array, you have to specify how big it is. It can't get any bigger. So getting back to our original problem, some people might order one pizza, some people might order twelve. Whenever you have a, a big variance like that, it's kind of tough to know how big to make it if you have to pre-make the array. Do you make it for 12 elements? Because, gee, that's the biggest order I ever remember getting was for 12 elements, for, for 12 elements in the array, or for 12 pizzas. Well, that's not a good idea. What if there's a really big party that some very rich person is putting on, and their order, they want to order 20 pizza? Could you imagine telling Bill Gates, I'm sorry we can't process your order because we can only allow you to order up to 12 pizzas? So, <laughs> exactly. Yes? Is the best solution just to be uh, specify a number of pizzas as an argument and then use that to size the array? When you uh, there's a better solution than that. Okay. All right. Uh, and the better solution than that would be to use a, 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 a field or, or a, a class called the array list. An array list is a lot like an array, except it contains a variable number of things. In other words, it can grow, it can expand, and it can contract. So you can add stuff to the array list, you can get rid of stuff from the array list. All right? So you don't have to predefine. You declare it initially as empty, and you can add as many pizzas as you want to to the array list. All right? So, our array list is going to consist of an array list that contains a pizza object. And this is one thing that throws a lot of beginning students. They think, uh, I'm going to declare an array that's going to contain a string. And the string, string might be a description of the pizza. No, this is object-oriented land, all right? Whereas we can declare and we can put objects into variables. We're not just dealing with the primitive or the simple variables like strings or integers or whatever. We can put an array list that consists of pizza objects. Just like when you do your student class, you'll probably make an array list of course objects because a student can take multiple courses. So how do you make an array list? Well, it's a class. So you say array list, you then put in the slanty brackets, the greater than or less than size side, an indication of what kinds of objects are going to be put in here. That's a restriction of an array list. You can have a array of primitives. So you could have an array of ints if you wanted to. You could have an array of booleans. In the case of a array, an array list, it has to be an object reference. So you can't have an array list of ints. There's a way around that, fortunately. We'll talk about that later on in the term. So it can't be a primitive. Can't be a primitive. This guy can't be a primitive. Has to be a class. So I'm going to call my array list list of pizzas equals new 
array list. Pizza. Let me double check this just to be sure. So that declares a something that's like an array. In fact, I might misspeak and call it an array. It's actually an array list. And the array list is called list of pizzas. And that array list can only contain pizzas. That's the only object that I can put in that array list. If I try to put anything else in the array list, it'll give me an error. What I have to do is I have to import that class at the very beginning. Like this. If you're using a class that's in a different folder than your code is, or it's not part of the very basic framework of Java, you have to import that class. And in this case, array lists aren't really included in the basic framework of Java, so you have to import and you have to tell Java where to find the code for that so that it can compile correctly. All right, I'm going to write a couple constructors. And I'm going to write two constructors. One is going to accept a name and a phone number. Set the name and the phone number. The address, I can default to something if I want to. Maybe NA. Hey, we don't, we don't have the address for this person. And finally, if we don't have an address for them, we're probably not delivering it, right? So I can default this delivery to false. I can then write another constructor that accepts a string for name, a string for phone, a string for address, and a boolean for and a boolean for is a delivery. So I can go and set the address to arg address and set is delivery to arg delivery. Okay. We would need gets and sets for all these variables. I'm going to put a comment in here because I'm going to come back and do them, but maybe not today because I got 10 minutes left. I want to try to get through um, everything um, to price an order and to at least test that out. So gets and sets for all attributes. 
Okay. So, there's two other methods that I want, at the very least. I want to be able to add this pizza to the order. All right. Think if you were doing this online, if maybe you had a web page. All right. You go in and you pick all the parameters for your pizza, then you click Add to Order. So that would add that pizza to your order. All right. Or if you called in and the person was working a terminal, you would describe the pizza that you wanted. They would pick all the values in their GUI. When they're all done, it would say Add to Order. And then you could go and add it to order. So I want the ability to add a pizza to my order. All right. So I'm going to create a method. Doesn't return anything. It's called add pizza. And it accepts as an argument a pizza object. All right. And I want to add that to the array list. Well, how do you add something to an array list? Remember, an array list is not an array. So, I'm going to look how to add an element. All right. How do you add to an array list? You can add by saying your array list dot add, and that will add the element to the array list. So, to add a piece to the array list, what piece do I want to add? Well, whatever the argument is. I'm going to go list of pizzas. dot add arg pizza. So whatever pizza I give as an argument to this function when I call it is going to get added to the order. All right. Now I want to figure out the cost of the order. Let's go look about the same public double Calculate cost. I don't need to pass any arguments in here, right? Because I can calculate the order, the cost of the order, based on the attributes that are already there. The cost of the order is the cost of every pizza that's part of the list of pizzas, plus, if it's delivery, $2. So I'm going to declare a double cost equals zero. I'm going to put the comments in first. And finally, all right, so I'm going to loop through all pizzas. What is my loop going to look like? All right. It's going to look like this. We use a for loop. You probably have done something like this in C sharp to loop through an array. Loop through an array list is not that much different. 
I'm going to say 4. I equals 0. I equals 0 means what? We're going to, means, we're going to start our counting with 0. Because that's the way array lists and arrays work. They start the numbering with 0. I want to do this as long as I is less than the number of elements in the array. All right? Or array list. In this case, if there were five pizzas on the order, those, order, those pieces have an index of 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. So there's five of them, and the number of those pizzas go from 0 to 4. All right? Now, what we need now to find out how many, is there a way to determine how many things are in an array list? Well, I hope so. And the way that you do it is the name list dot size. So I'm going to say for I less than the name of my list, list of pizzas dot size. And that is a method, so we use the parentheses afterwards. Each iteration through the loop we increment by one. So is the, the array list basically um, the same as the list object in C-sharp? I'm not familiar with the list object in C-sharp, but yeah, it probably is. All right. I'm going to grab the next pizza in the list. Well, what's the number of the next pizza in the list? Well, it's, well, zero's the first one, one's the second one, two's the third one. What variable contains the value of the next piece I want to look at? I. I. So I want to be able to get the ith pizza from the list. So I'm going to say pizza p equals list oops, list of pizzas dot get i. So what does that do? It returns the object that's in the i position. That's what the get method does. So first time through the loop, i has a value of 0. So it gets the thing, the object, that has a subscript of 0, or an index of 0. And I know for sure that's a pizza. So I can store the pizza that this gets into a pointer for a pizza. I'm not creating a new object, notice, because I don't see the word new here. So I'm not creating a new object. I'm simply getting a pointer to the object in the list. So now, my cost is equal to cost plus what? That pizza's cost. How do we calculate the cost of a pizza? We call calculate cost. So this is the next pizza on the list. So I'm going to ask that pizza, hey, what is your cost? No, because here I'm calling the calculate cost method on a pizza object. So it will use the calculate cost method that's defined in the pizza class. This is a calculate cost that's part of an or order. So if I call the calculate cost on an order object, this is the function I get. If I call it on a pizza object, this is the function I get. All right? Now, all done if is delivery then I add two dollars to the cost.
and then I return it. Okay, so let's go test this. Do you need to return that? Yes, I do. Now, test it. Well, let me save this first. This is a Java class, so I will store it as a Java source file. And the name of it should match the name of the class, which is order. All right, now in my test case, I've created two pizzas and I've priced those individually. I'm going to create an order now. And I'm going to create an order for pickup. So I have to give it Well, I could call, I'm going to call this constructor. Order for Mike. My phone number is 440-366-4796. All right. I want to add the first pizza to my order. So I go add pizza to this order, add the pizza that's contained in the variable P1. To this order, also add the pizza contained in P2. Now finally, whoops, The cost of the order is order, calculate cost. Okay, let's test this, make sure that it works. Save everything. Compile it. Ah, for I, I didn't declare the variable I. My mistake, I need to say for int I. Okay, it works. Or uh, it compiled. All right, so cost of the first one is $10, cost of the second one is $12, the order cost is $22. Well, that worked. All right, so this went and it took the two pizzas that I added to the order, summed up their cost. It's not delivery, so it did not add the delivery surcharge to it, and it came up with a cost for as $22. I rushed a little bit at the end to get all the way through. I wanted to complete this example. We will go over this again on Tuesday. We have not thoroughly tested this, to be sure, right? All right. And we'll do it on Monday instead. All right, I said Tuesday. I'm a day ahead of myself. So yeah, we'll do it uh, on, on Monday. Uh, pardon me? Yeah, remember, every example I, I give is posted to Canvas. Play around with this if you want. You know, change the way that you calculate the, the cost of a pizza. Include the crust in the factor. Maybe thick crust costs a dollar extra than thin crust or whatever. And play around with that and see how that works. We'll talk more about this next time in class. Any questions? All right, see you up in lab.